Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Silas Allard, and I am the Managing Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. It is my pleasure to welcome you today uh, for the lecture on behalf of the Center. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion is a thought leader dedicated to producing innovative scholarship, facilitating challenging conversations, convening the best minds and training the next generation of academics, lawyers, and religious leaders to advance the emerging global conversation on law and religion. We are proud to have led this field of study for over 35 years through our path-breaking research projects that have produced over 350 monographs and journal symposia, our three book series with leading academic publishers, the preeminent journal in the field, the Journal of Law and Religion, six graduate degree programs, a dozen interdisciplinary courses across the university, as well as important public conversations, such as the lecture we are privileged to host this afternoon. I encourage you to learn more about the center at our website, and you can also follow our work on Facebook and Twitter. Today's lecture is the second in our 2019 Harold J. Berman Forum in Law and Religion. This lecture series explores one of the vexing challenges of our day, how to pursue the common good in an age of increasing diversity. How do we make space for difference in our society and especially in our legal system? How do we mediate the inevitable conflicts of interests, values, and rights that will occur? These are not, of course, new questions, but the imperative to address them is continually renewed by the necessity of confronting the continuation of old prejudices some formerly latent and now overt, others woven deeply into the fabric of our institutions and society. The imperative to address these questions of diversity is also renewed by new conflicts over the composition and value commitments of our communities as those communities, both in the United States and globally, continue to change. We opened the Berman Forum in February with a lecture by Douglas Laycock, Robert E. Scott, Distinguished Professor of Law and Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. Professor Laycock launched this lecture series with an examination of how the recent Masterpiece Cake Shop case could portend more robust constitutional protections for religious exemptions in the United States and why that outcome would further our common good. But much of what makes the questions raised by this forum so vexing is that whatever constitutional doctrine or other law we have at our disposal to attempt a reconciliation of our religious diversity, that law, like all law, makes value judgments. And it is, at least in the hard cases, a clash of values that is at stake in the questions raised by this forum. So today begins three days of lectures that focus uh, and explore that complexity and challenge. Tomorrow, we are privileged to host Jonathan L. Walton, Plummer Professor of Christian Morals and QC Minister in the Memorial Church at Harvard University, who will lecture on freedom for what? The underside of religious protections for the black freedom movement. And we will host that in conjunction with Candler School of Theology and in their wonderful facilities. On Wednesday, we will return to this auditorium to hear Mona Siddiqui, Professor of Islam and Interreligious Studies at the University of Edinburgh, lecture on doing God in Europe, the limits of law and pluralism. We are extremely fortunate today because there is no, per there is no better person to start this three-day conversation on the complexity of religious diversity and the law than our lecturer, Professor Stanley Fish. Professor Fish is one of the country's leading public intellectuals and a world-renowned literary theorist and legal scholar. He began his academic career in the English department at the University of California, then became the Keenan Professor of English and Humanities at Johns Hopkins University, where he taught from 1974 to 1985, before becoming Arts and Sciences Professor of English and Professor of Law at Duke University. From 1999 to 2004, he served as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois. Professor Fish currently spends half of his time teaching at Florida International College of Law 
as the Davidson Kahn Distinguished Professor, Distinguished University Professor of Humanities and Law, and half of his time at Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law as the Florsheimer Distinguished Visiting Professor of Law. Professor Fish is an extraordinarily prolific author, having written over 200 scholarly books and articles, which have been profoundly influential in the fields of comparative literature and law, as well as in the public conversation on some of the most pressing issues of our day. Beginning during his time at Johns Hopkins University and continuing now for over 40 years, Professor Fish has brought the practice of reading against the grain to the legal academy. Drawing from his training in literary theory and a nimble and deeply creative intellect, Professor Fish has exposed the contradictions, complications, and contestations that animate US constitutional law and the tradition of Anglo-American jurisprudence. And his task is not yet finished with his next book, The First, How to Think About Hate Speech, Campus Speech, Religious Speech, Fake News, Post-Truth, and Donald Trump arriving this fall. It is a great honor to invite Professor Stanley Fish to the stage to continue to challenge our understandings and assumptions about liberalism, pluralism, and the religion clause. Thank you very much for that kind, and I must say, uh, accurate. Not, in, not, not, not accuracy in the terms of praise, but accuracy in, a, in, a, in its description uh, of uh, my multi-decade project. I thought that was good. Okay, let me begin by asking the audience a couple of questions in advance. How many of you would be willing to stand up and define religion? Oh. Uh, how many of you would be willing to stand up and define pluralism? Hmm. Now, okay. Well, we'll see where we can take that. I'm going to discuss the definition of religion in the course of my remarks. And I'm also going to discuss extensively the relationship between religion, pluralism, and American constitutional law. Um, I'm going to do that uh, reading parts of a chapter um, in the book that, whose subtitle uh, you just heard, but it's a subtitle I'm so inordinately uh, fond of that I'll repeat it. That is, how to think about hate speech, campus speech, religious speech, fake news, post-truth, and Donald Trump. So this is from the religion speech chapter. Uh, and because I've, I'm cutting 34 pages down to what I hope is a manageable unit, I left out a great deal, including uh, an extensive discussion of the masterpiece cake shop case. But perhaps that can turn up in question and answer. Now, I do think it's important before I begin, oh, I should also say, uh, in the introduction, um, you, were to, you heard uh, that a part of the project of this institution is to figure out how to move toward common ground. My response to that is forget about it. Will never happen. Uh, just, just will not happen. Although the attempt and effort, quite considerable, mounted by people of genuine intelligence and energy um, is to provide uh, such a path to common ground. And often uh, those who provide it are preaching what I would call the gospel of pluralism. So let me define pluralism before I begin reading uh, from uh, the paper. Uh, pluralism, and of course this definition is tendentious and many in the audience uh, might disagree with it. Pluralism is a strategy or way of thinking by, by means of which the demands of strong religion 
and the demands of religious tolerance can be reconciled. To which I say, as I did in the title of an essay written some years ago, Mission Impossible. Uh, pluralism tells us that the liberal state safeguards the rights of citizens to choose their religious beliefs, but the state itself has no regard for the beliefs chosen. Rather, it equalizes them as instance, instances of a more inclusive category in relation to which particular beliefs are authorized, but indifferently so. To the liberal state, the specific content of what you believe is of no matter. That's pluralism. And what it does is deprive religion of its claims to be special and totalizing, that is, commanding obedience at any and all times, and instead reduces religion to just one more discourse allowed to occupy a place, but not every place in the public sphere. So again, you may disagree uh, with that definition, uh, and I hope there will be time for you to register that disagreement uh, should you have it. Okay, the title of the chapter in the, in the manuscript, in the book, is, let me make sure I get it right, why the religion clause of the First Amendment doesn't belong in the Constitution. That's the title of the chapter. Now, what could I possibly mean by saying that the religion clause doesn't belong in the Constitution? Everybody knows that the desire for religious freedom motivated many of those who left Europe and came to what they called often the New Jerusalem. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black rehearsed the familiar story in a 1947 case, Everson v. Board of Education. Black said, a large proportion of the early settlers of this country came here to escape the bondage of law which compelled them to support and attend government favored churches, unquote. So there are sound historical reasons for the inclusion in the Constitution of a clause forbidding Congress to establish a state religion or to place burdens on the religious free exercise of its citizens. And I don't, of course, intend to deny that history. And I don't want to reopen the 18th century debates between Federalists and Anti-Federalists about the wisdom of having a Bill of Rights at all. My point is conceptual rather than historical. However the religion clause got into the Constitution, we can still ask whether the principles it announces fit with the more general principles informing the entire document, and I will argue that they do not. But before I elaborate that argument, let me pose a prior question one I've already put to you. What exactly is meant by religion? In the absence of a definition of a religion, it's hard to see how you would set about reasoning when a religion clause case came up. Here is a definition that was put forward in the Universal Military Training and Service Act of 1958. After stating that those who object to services in the armed forces on the basis of religious training and belief will be exempt from service, the act then defined religious training and belief. And I quote, religious training and belief means an individual's belief in relation to a supreme being involving duties superior to those arising from any merely human relation. But religious belief does not include essentially political, sociological, or philosophical views, nor does it include a merely personal moral code. So to qualify for an exemption according to this definition, you must believe in a God whose commands supersede the commands of any earthly authority. And that belief must be acquired in the course of, quote, religious training. That is training administered by something like a church which comes complete with doctrines, rituals, ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical hierarchies, 
criteria for entry and for expulsion. The point is important because the way the religion clause is interpreted will depend on what definition of religion is in place. The scope of the free exercise clause, for example, uh, will be quite large. Will be quite large if religious exercise is included to understand, I mean, is understood to include, quote, the performance of duties superior to those arising from any human relationship. Read strongly, that means that when there is a clash between earthly and secular duties on the one hand, and the duty one owes to God on the other, the duty owes to God wins. This was certainly Abraham's understanding when he obeyed without question God's command to sacrifice his only son for a burnt offering. The example may seem extreme, and of course, God stayed Abraham's hand, but it can stand in for all those moments when there is a conflict between human obligations, including familial, legal, institutional, political, and even moral obligations, and the obligation to obey deity. Now, in two cases, United States versus Seeger, 1965, and Welsh versus the United States, 1970, the court relaxed the Universal Military and Training Act's definition of religion and let in everything the act had excluded. It came up with a new test for conscientious objection. And I quote it, namely, does the claim belief occupy the same place in the life of the objector as an orthodox belief in God holds in the life of one clearly qualified for exemption? In short, political, philosophy, philosophical, and even merely personal views now count too as the basis for an exemption from service. In a troubled concurrence to the Welsh case, Justice Holland observed that the court's new test completely ignores and overrides, as I quote him, the act's distinction between theistic and non-theistic religions. In so, in so doing, Holland continues, the court, and again I quote him, has performed a lobotomy and completely transformed the statute. It has also made the conscientious objection test, this is me, uh, not Holland, it has also made the conscientious objective test difficult to administer. What once was a clear, if parochial, requirement, belief in God acquired through traditional religious training, has now become a requirement so loose that almost anything in the way of strong commitment might meet it, as long, and as I am quoting from Welsh, as long it is, as it was sincere, honest, and made in good faith, unquote. Now, determining whether those conditions, sincerity, honesty, and good faith, have been satisf satisfied opens up a new can of legal worms. And one might pause to ask, what exactly does a court bent on dislodging traditional religious practice mean by the phrase good faith? What right does the court have to this phrase? By its reasoning, any faith from any source is good. This leads me to my first large assertion. Once you soften the distinction between religious commitments and commitments grounded in philosophy or personal opinion, it is hard to see what the religion clause means or if it means anything. I think that the Welsh and Seeger case uh, uh, opinions were disastrous. It is at least odd to define religion by detaching, by detaching it from its doctrinal content. Folding religious obligations into the category of obligations strongly felt by both religious and non-religious persons leaves us with the vocabulary of free exercise and non-establishment, but with no clear reference for its terms. The Seeger and Welsh courts, courts deal with the awkward category of religious affirmation, awkward because by the logic of liberalism, religious affirmation should be no different from any other, 
They deal with this awkwardness by generalizing it out of existence, a strategy that later becomes an art under the rubric of pluralism. I bring up Seeger and Welsh at the outset because they raise a question you will be asking. What religion or whose religion do I have in mind when I talk about the demands religion makes on its adherence in the context of conflicts between civic and religious duties? The religion that takes the Abraham-like form of a total fidelity to transcendent command or the softer religion, if it is a religion at all, whose commands are looser and more diffuse and therefore more available to being harmonized with the secular protocols of the liberal state. In general, I shall be taking as my model the more severe religiosity of those who will not relax the obligations of faith for a moment. I do this because the uncompromising model sharpens the issues that animate current disputes between, for example, those merchants who refuse in the name of the free exercise of religion to lend their skills to the celebration of same-sex marriage, as opposed to those who argue that the state's commitment to eliminating discrimination outweighs any free exercise rights. The opposing positions on this and other issues will be tied to opposing views of what religion is. Those who put forward strong free exercise claims in, insist on the unique categorical nature of the obligations their religion imposes on them. And they argue that properly understood, the religion clause mandates accommodations that exempt them from what are otherwise generally applicable laws. On the other hand, those who would limit free exercise and grant few, if any, accommodations deny the uniqueness of religious obligations and, analog and, and analogize them to obligations non-religious persons also feel, which is exactly what the Seeger and Welsh courts do. And if you do that, the question of accommodation need never arise. So one party is saying religion is special. That's a perennial question in the literature, as many of you will know. One party is saying religion is special and must be treated as such. The other is saying religion is not special and that the liberal state can be fair to religion or to a religion recast in liberalism's terms, even if religion's deepest claim, the claim to be supreme in authority, is denied. Okay, now that I have gotten the question of defining religion out of the way by fudging it at length, we can take up another question, a question implied by my title. Why is there a religion clause in the Constitution anyway? And remember, this is not a historical, but a conceptual question. I ask that question because both in its spirit and in its detail, the Constitution is a liberal document. By, way, by, means I which, by, mean, by which I mean, the Constitution follows and extends the principles of Enlightenment liberalism principles that, as you know, mandate the protection of individual rights, including the right to free speech, the right to petition, the right to assemble, and the right of a press to be free of government interference. While the key value in other political systems, monarchy, theocracy, dictatorship, a collective, while the key values in those systems is obedience or conformity, the key value in the liberal scheme of government is individual freedom, an individual freedom means individual choice. To be sure, freedom of choice does not include the choice to perform criminal acts. No state could countenance generally unlawful behavior and still in any sense be a state. But within the very large category of acts that are not labeled criminal by statutes, the individual is by and large free in the liberal vision. That freedom is equally distributed, which means that the state's protection must be extended without favor. It cannot be stipulated in advance that the speech or ideas or religious views of some citizens are valued or devalued more than the speech or ideas or religious views or anti-religious views of other citizens. No list of preferred or dispreferred viewpoints should be kept by the administrators of the liberal state. 
But here's the rub. The religion clause of the First Amendment names both a preferred and a dispreferred view. And it is the same one, religion. The free exercise clause prefers religion when it forbids the state to burden religious free exercise. There is a long-standing debate as to whether free exercise includes actions inspired by religious commitments or is limited to thinking and expressing religious thoughts. If it is the latter, the clause seems superfluous, superfluous since the right to think and speak your mind is already guaranteed by the free expression clause. But if it is the former, if it is religiously inspired acts that the state cannot sanction, we run into the danger of having an act judged lawful if it was performed in obedience to a religious tenet and unlawful if it was performed by a non-believer for a secular reason. And there are cases that have ruled in just that way. We shall return to this tension, but for the time being, it is enough to note that however it is interpreted, strongly or weakly, the free exercise clause pays a special attention to religiously inspired deeds, verbal or physical. And paying that attention is a non-liberal and a non-democratic thing to do. The Establishment Clause, of course, also singles out religion for a special attention. But this attention is negative. Nothing the state does should tend to play a role in the establishment of an official religion. The state, and I hear rehearsed doctrines that are familiar to all of you, the state should not compose prayers to be recited by public school students. The state should not tie public employment to the affirmation of a religious belief. The state, said James Madison in his memorial and remonstrance, should not require citizens to contribute even three pence to the support of a religious institution. So the Establishment Clause asks the courts to be alert to those moments when something the government says or does, perhaps in all innocence, so entangles it in religious affairs that the wall of separation between church and state is breached. As you all know, the phrase wall of separation is not in the Constitution, but appears in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists in 1802. An even earlier version of the doctrine implied in, Tom, in Jefferson's phrase was laid out by John Locke in his letter concerning toleration in 1689. To the civil magistrate, says Locke, is left the care of the material world, quote, outward things such as money, land, house, furniture, and the like, unquote, while to the church and her ministers belong quote, the care of the salvation of men's souls. The task, says Locke, is to assure that the integrity and separateness of each jurisdiction is maintained. Quote, he jumbles heaven and earth together who mixes those societies which are in their original end, business, and in everything else perfectly distinct, unquote. The borders between these two societies must be patrolled, and one of the vehicles of mixing or jumbling to be avoided is religious speech, which in certain forms can constitute a breach of the dividing line by aligning the state with a religious view or a religious purpose. There, are, there is a succession of cases concerned with asking whether that line has been crossed and therefore violated the Establishment Clause. And the answers that emerge constitute a judge jurisprudence that is quite often bewildering. It is important to remember that these cases exist only because of the anomaly of a form of speech that has been labeled special in both positive and negative ways in a liberal regime whose first principle is that no form of speech is special. Were we, be, were we faithful to the logic and spirit of Enlightenment liberalism, religious speech would be treated like any other form of speech, no better, no worse. But there is a continuing pressure, both cultural and political, to accord religion a special place, both positive and negative. And when the Constitution seems to be saying, no, you can't do that, the state and the courts will contrive 
to do what the Constitution apparently forbids. And the labors performed in the service of this contrivance will be acrobatic and at times breathtaking. I have many examples, but I have time for only one. Suppose you're walking past the county courthouse and you see on the top of its staircase a Christmas tree adorned with a cross. What will you make of it? Will you think to yourself, here is the state paying tribute to Christianity? Or will you think, what a nice tribute to the holiday season, unquote. The question might seem odd. Of course the state is acknowledging the centrality of a religion and mocking the birth of its founder. But what seems ordinary in, what seems obvious in ordinary life is not so in Supreme Court religious cause cases. Consider Lynch v. Donnelly, a 1984 landmark case that exhibits much of the complexity and indeed oddity of religion clause opinions. The question at the heart of that case is what, if anything, is being said by the city of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and I must say that I am a native of Providence, Rhode Island, and the idea of set, even setting foot in Pawtucket is anathema to me. Uh, what is being said by the city of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, when it annually mounts a Christmas display, display at the center of which is a crush, a tableau consisting of the figures of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, various angels, shepherds, and kings, and a collection of appropriately adoring animals. A number of Pawtucket residents brought a cause of action alleging that the crush violates the establishment cause, and I quote, because it has the appearance of affiliating the city with the Christian beliefs that the crush represents, unquote. A court of appeals affirmed the district court's judgment in favor of the protesters, but the Supreme Court reversed. The court admits that, quote, the crush will have a special meaning to those faith, whose faith includes the celebration of religion, religious masses. But the court argues that the main purpose of erecting the crush, and I quote, is to serve commercial interests and benefit merchants and their employers. To be sure, the government speaks through the crush. But according to the court, it doesn't say, join us in worship. It says, join us in spending. Now, although the majority's reasoning might seem bizarre and strange, it will seem less so if it is read in the context of a history in which the separation of church and state has been honored more in the breach than in the observance. As the majority reminds us, in the very week that Congress approved the Establishment Clause, quote, it enacted legislation providing for paid chaplains of the House and Senate. And of course, there are coins that bear the motto, in God we trust. And since 1954, we have a Pledge of Allegiance that includes the phrase, under God. These official actions, the court says, indicate an unwillingness to take the separation of state and church so seriously that every vestige or hint of religion must be scrubbed from the public square. The public display of the crash the majority maintains is nothing more than, quote, an acknowledgement of our religious heritage. The crash does not ex exhort us to believe in Christ as the Son of God and our Savior. It is only, quote, unquote, a passive symbol put to a thoroughly secular use. Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus could have been any small family welcoming the opening of a department store. Now, if you are surprised and perhaps even distressed by the removal from a Christian symbol of its Christian significance, you have company in the dissenting opinions. Justice William Brennan, joined by Marshall, Blackman, and Stevens, roundly declares that the primary effect of including a nativity scene in the city's display is to place the government's imprimatur of approval on the particular religious beliefs exemplified by the crash, unquote. If the display of the crash is government speech, as it certainly is, then what that speech is saying, Brennan insists, is, quote, here is the truth we as citizens are being called on to witness. 
The reduction of that religious message to a commercial one is a piece of transubstantiation Brennan refuses to participate in. He is protecting, protesting against a version of the strategy we have already seen deployed in the Seeger and Welsh cases. Defuse the conflict between the singling out for special attention of religious speech and the supposed neutrality of the Constitution toward all forms of expression by draining the religious speech of its religious significance. Transform an exemption from military service based on religious observance into an exemption available to anyone who believes anything. Transform an obviously religious display into a piece of holiday advertising. What a move. I mean, it's just absolutely breathtaking uh, when, uh, when uh, as I said before, when you think of it. But the court's most sophisticated strategy for secular, secularizing, or as, I, or as I would say, laundering religious speech is to seize upon those aspects of the speech that can be described in secular terms without any reference to their religious dimension. Once you do that, you can affirm the speech's constitutionality on purely secular grounds and bypass the problem of religion in the public square entirely. Again, John Locke provides the template in his example of Melibius, a fictional character from pastoral poetry who owns a calf and wishes to kill it and then to offer it as a sacrifice to his god. Locke reduces the issue to the right of a property owner to deal with his property as he sees fit and concludes that just as Melibius may kill his calf in order to serve it as his dinner table, so may he kill the calf in order to propiti propitiate his deity. And I quote, what, might, what may be spent on a feast may be spent on a sacrifice, unquote. Locke then imagines a situation when for public reasons, public health reasons, the state forbids all slaughter of animals. This, says Locke, is perfectly unobjectable, unobjectionable, for the state is not intentionally regulating Melibius' religious performance. Rather, it is restricting a general activity which just happens to be put to religious uses by some persons. Quote, in this case, the law is not made about a religion, but a political matter. Nor is the sacrifice but the slaughter of calves thereby prohibited. That is, the slaughter of calves is prohibited. The sacrifice of calves is not specifically prohibited. It's just drawn in to the general law. The ordinance forbidding animal slaughter may impede religious observance as a matter of fact, but that's OK, because that was not the intention in forming it. So again, once a religious activity or a form of religious speech has been, turn been turned into just another secular option, serving up the calf for dinner and laying the calf on an altar are essentially the same acts. Erecting a creche is an act no different from the installation of a sleigh with reindeer. Once that transformation has been produced, the state's right to regulate is secure from any establishment clause challenge. Each of these strategies, and there are more than I've given you today, each of these strategies, denying to religious symbols and phrases any religious significance, focusing on those aspects of religious speech and action that are also found in secular speech and action, each of these strategies plays its part in the grand project of making religious safe, religion safe for the public sphere. But the general success of this project entails a cost for believers. A religion that has been sanitized for general public use by removing from it the doctrinal tenets a secular state cannot affirm is a religion entirely defamed. Religion is given a place at the table but in a form that poses no threat to liberal tolerance because the claim to have a source in divinity has been either bracketed or set aside. The liberal state can accommodate religious speech as long as religious speech relaxes any assertion of precedent. 
as long as it does not present itself as commanding the table and arrogating to itself the right to distinguish between the true and the false. Liberal theorist Cecile Laborde, Laborde explains this logic in her new book, Liberalism's Religion. Quote, religion assertions of the kind, God wants us to do X, cannot, she says, form the basis of reasons offered in the public square because such reasons would be unintelligible and inaccessible to non-believing citizens. Laborde refers to reasons the liberal state cannot take seriously as, this is a wonderful phrase, religious reasons stricto sensu. So this is what she wants to bar and get rid of. Religious reasons stricto sensu, that is, religious reasons that are actually seriously religious. You can't have any of those. In a strict sense, of course, religious reasons derive from and assert a religion's core doctrinal tenets, including, of course, the tenet that God is the ultimate source of wisdom. But if religious discourse is stripped, and that is Laborde's word, of any claim of ultimate authority, it becomes dissolved into the mix of possible and plural repositories of wisdom and is therefore legitimized as a participant in the secular process of decision making. Properly diminished in the pluralist spirit, religion gets the liberal good housekeeping seal of approval. I hate that stuff. It's just awful. But a religion so stripped of its doctrinal content will be of little interest to a strong believer who is pledged to the quote unquote strict sense of his faith and will likely disdain a domesticated version of it. What does the liberal state say to the believer who when told that his religious views are fine as long as he does not follow them too strictly replies, no thank you. You're asking me to trade my God for yours. That question, always lurking in the background of religious course jurisprudence, comes front and center when some county clerks, bakers, florists, and photographers refuse to relax the dictates of their faith when they are in conflict with generally applicable laws. The state is then presented with an unhappy choice. Either it can cede some of its authority to strong religious believers and run the risk of making the individual the judge of which laws to obey, or the state can stand firm and be accused of abrogating the free ex exercise rights of its citizens. So the question is quite reasonably, is there a middle way between these two extremes, allowing religious persons to determine which laws they should obey or curtailing the free exercise rights of religious citizens? Is there a middle way? Now there is an army of legal academics trying to find one. I can't tell you how large this industry is, but it's absolutely huge. Every book and essay that comes out is an attempt to find this middle way. And typically their strategy, which is a version of the strategy employed to launder the religion out of religious symbols, is to deny the distinctiveness of religion and subsume religion in a larger category that includes secular activities similarly situated. Now, as you all know, similarly situated is a phrase absolutely dear to legal academics. And usually it's a phrase designed to hide something that it cannot acknowledge, which is that there's nothing similar about the situations. But we'll go, to, go into that uh, in, in a moment. That is the pluralist move. Religion is protected, not because of what it is, but because of what it is like. Let me repeat that, that's pluralism. Religion is protected, not because of what it is, but because of what it is like. For political theorist Cecile Laborde, the larger category uh, in which religion is subsumed is, quote, practices that are expressive of individual integrity. Religion, Laborde concedes, is surely one of these practices, but so, she says, are other life projects, 
uh, and this is uh, citizens' pursuit, such as a dedication to environmental health or an all-consuming resolution to minister to the poor, or a determination to root out political corruption. In short, any passion in relation to which someone says, this is who I am. And it is, of course, more than possible that a zealous commitment to a social or moral good that is not religious in the usual sense of the word will generate behavior that runs up against the generally applicable law. And when that happens, Laborde explains, there must be a formula that recognizes the centrality of the revered practice to those who engage in it while taking into account the harms and costs suffered by those for whom the practice is not central or even significant. In the law, this is the category of third party harms. And a lot of academic theorizing about the relationship between religious demands and the demands of a liberal civic society centers, a lot, of, a lot of the argument centers on third party harms. Uh, I think that third party harms are a red herring. I don't see any coherence to the uh, demand that we pay attention to them, uh, and I'm going to tell you why. Again, what we need according to Laborde, is the formula that recognizes the centrality of the practices uh, of those who engage in them while taking into account the harms and costs suffered by those for whom the practices are not central or significant. And here is her proposed formula. And this is very typical. Laborde is the smartest of this bunch of people. She's extremely smart. She's extremely conscientious. She's extremely comprehensive. She's extremely generous. She is generous to me a lot more generous to me than I am about to be generous to her. Uh, but what they all do, and this is again something that we find not only in religious court jurisprudence, but all over the place in the law. She proposes a four-part test. There's been a three-part test, a five-part test, a six-part test, a seven-part test. The law just loves these tests, which of course never work. Think of the lemon test. Okay, here's hers. When a commitment of a kind that involves what the board calls a deep identity claim is burdened by an existing law, four questions, she says, should be asked. Bear with me here. Question one, how direct is the burden? Question two, how severe is the burden? Question three, how proportionate is the burden to the aim pursued by the law? And question four, can it be alleviated without excessive cost shifting? That's the third party benefits question. The burden the board refers to in these questions is the burden placed on religious free exercise by generally applicable laws uh, that forbid acts a religion commands. Her questions are designed to determine the proper balance between the strict application of those laws and the, the accommodations that might be granted to believers. By assuming that balance is what everyone seeks, Lord Laborde sidesteps the often uncompromising nature of religious obligation. Thou shall have no other gods before me is not a pronouncement that invites the believer to reply, let's talk about it. Laborde conducts her analysis as if parties to any dispute she imagines were good liberal rationalists trying to achieve a resolution fair to everyone. Now let me just say in advance of my explanation of the point I'm about to make. Whenever in a discussion of the relationship between religious obligations and civic obligations, you come across the word fair, you know that the argument is cooked. The word fair is an absolute signal uh, that the game has been thrown in advance. The board conducts, okay. Uh, the board conducts her analysis as all parties to any imagined dispute were good rich, liberal rationalists trying to achieve a resolution fair to everyone. So in this spirit, questions one and two seek to determine whether the life project is significantly frustrated and disabled by the generally applicable law, 
or is it a limitation that leaves the core of the project intact? Question three reverses the concern and asks whether burdening the practice is essential to the law being invoked, or could the law survive this exemption to its rule and still function more or less as intended? And question four asks, if we exempt the practice from the generally applicable law, how much of the burden lifted from it will be transferred to innocent third parties? Now, there's nothing wrong with these questions. It's just that, that they are the invention of a project that doesn't, in fact, announce his name. And that is the project of making sure that religious discourse and religion has no force or bite whatsoever. The reasoning informing all four of the board's questions says that is in a society where cooperation among citizens endowed with equal rights is the goal, there must be, and I quote her, limits on the untrammeled pursuit of people's life project, unquote. Were there no limits, the board explains, there would be, quote, no fair framework for the sharing of the burdens and benefits in common, i.e. there'd be no common ground. So, give a little, get a little, compromise, and always be mindful of the other fellow's life plans. Now, this sounds more than reasonable if fair, fairness is the central word in your vocabulary, as it is for those pluralists who see no essential difference between religion and other quote-unquote life projects. But fairness, the equal treatment of everyone in the relevant population is not what strong religious believers are after. They are in possession of and possessed by the truth they want to testify to at all times and in all contexts. They will not respond positively when Laborde insists that, quote, all religious believers must take some responsibility for the pursuit of their integrity protecting practices out of a consideration for the fair pursuit of other citizens' projects and opportunities, unquote. That consideration will move strong believers only if for some unfathomable reason they have set aside their religious beliefs and installed in their place a belief in fairness, equal respect, and other virtues that are liberalism's content. That consideration will move strong believers only if, in Laborde's words, they have, quote, signed on to a higher order interest in living under political justice on this earth rather than in living by the word of God. That is absolutely naked. And I will replace it, repeat it. Strong religious believers should sign on to a higher order interest in living under political justice on this earth rather than in living by the word of God. But why on earth would they do that? What makes the maintenance of the civil community an interest higher than the interest obeying God's will that is, in their view, really higher? Now, I'm not suggesting that religious believers have no regard for fairness in equal respect, only that they do not worship them. And that's a biggie. Why should Kim Davis, the county clerk in Kentucky, uh, care that couples she refuses to serve are forced to go elsewhere for marriage licenses, suffering both shame and inconvenience? Why should Jack Phillips, the baker in the Masterpiece Cake, Masterpiece Cake, Cake shop case. Why should Jack Phillips care that the same sex couples he will not bake for must search for another baker, perhaps in another town? Indeed, if these would be participants in a sinful practice are discomforted and blocked for a while from completing their projects, so much the better for them. At least for a few hours or days, they will have been saved despite themselves from doing something that will, uh, uh, that will uh, according uh, to Baker and Davis, harm their immortal souls. What Laborde and other liberal theorists fail to do is confront religious claims to have a special purpose on the truth, or rather they confront it either by ridiculing it as a claim a liberal state 
cannot take seriously, and that in fact is right, or by removing the claim from the picture when they bundle religious speech with other discourses that articulate a particular conception of the good, a quote from the board. In this way, the board explained, the state respects and protects religion, but only as one of the ways in which citizens live a life they think good, unquote. What this means, as Timothy Gordon Ash explains, is that while the state must exhibit respect for the believer as a believer, it needn't and shouldn't extend that respect to what the believers believe, especially when their beliefs lead to acts of discrimination the state forbids. Ash sees what he calls the difficulty, a mild word, this makes for believers and asks the right question. How can it be right to accept what is wrong? The answer, Ash says, and it is Labor's answer too, is that the believer's sense of right must give way to a higher good, higher that is than the good named by his religion, which has now become a secondary aspect of his being, something to be respected, a very good enlightenment liberalism word, something to be respected, but not something to be taken seriously. Now, in everything that has preceded, I have been ventriloquizing the voices of the various parties to these disputes, alternately adopting the tone and the vocabulary of one, and then adopting the tone and vocabulary of the other. I did that to indicate that I am not taking a side but rather illustrating why the two sides are irre irreconcilable. And at the heart of that irreconcilability is the insight that the religion clause, and especially the free exercise clause, is an anomaly. It doesn't belong, for it opens a door, the door to theocratic influence and even dominance. The rest of the Constitution just shut. It is tempting to describe this struggle as one between theological fiat on the one hand, and rational common sense on the other. But it would be more accurate to frame it as a struggle between two opposing theologies. Given the basic and inviolable assumptions underlying the two positions, the propositions that issue from each are entirely rational, at least from the perspective of each. And to the extent that each position is creed rooted in an unchallengeable conviction, either the, convi either the conviction that true authority transcends mortal norms and measures, or the conviction that mortal norms and measures are all we have. Each position, each of these positions, is a theology. The tendency in some quarters to regard the First Amendment as an object of worship with the ACLU as its mother church. The tendency in some courts to regard the First Amendment as an object of worship is on display in a number of Supreme Court decisions where the bare assertion of a speech interest is a sufficient counterweight to the harms caused by its exercise. One clear example is Snyder v. Phelps, the case in which the court held by an eight to one vote for the Westboro Baptist Church notorious for, include, for intruding on the funerals of young soldiers by waving signs saying, thank God for dead soldiers and you're going to hell, unquote. The church is motivated by the belief that God disapproves of the tolerance extended to gays and lesbians in this country and is expressing his disapproval through the death of these soldiers who are not presumed by the church to be gay. In dissent, Justice Alito wondered, as I quote, why the nation's commitment to free and open debate should be a license for vicious verbal assault, unquote. But Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority, while acknowledging the great pain inflicted on the, inflicted on the parents of the young men and women who die serving their country, declares that, quote, nevertheless, we cannot react to that pain by punishing the speaker, as a nation, we have chosen a different course, and that is to protect even hurtful speech on public issues. Robert rejects any balancing of First Amendment rights against the evils 
they might on occasion produce. And in an earlier case, United States versus Stevens, Roberts makes his position explicit. The First Amendment, he says, quote, reflects a judgment by the American people that the benefits of its restrictions outweigh the costs. If the First Amendment is placed in one scale, no amount of harms piled up in another could outweigh it. In Stevens, the courts include, in Stevens, the costs of affirming the First Amendment include the kittens that are crushed to death by the spiked shoes of a dominatrix in the videos who is, whose legality the court affirms. In the famous or infamous Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission decision, the course is the possible and likely corruption that would follow if restriction on campaign expenditure were relaxed. The arguments of both the majority and the dissenters in Citizens United are detailed, complicated, and speak to whether a corporation is a person and whether the old problem of money talks can be translated into First Amendment doctrine. But for Justice Kennedy, one fact trumps everything else. Quote, Section 441B's prohibition on corporate independent expenditures is a ban on speech, unquote. Game over. Any regulation that restricts the flow of speech is per se invalid. Now these three decisions, and there are many of them, exhibit the characteristic of a theology one of whose features is that it does not distinguish often between minor and major departures from core tenets. Any departure can be seen as a breach in a wall that must remain intact. That is precisely the stance of strong First Amendment adherents when they are urged to relax the severity of their position in the face of documented harm. They are being asked to turn their backs on their faith, and understandably, they recoil from such when publishers in this country and elsewhere gratuitously reprinted the infamous Danish cartoons regarded by many Muslims as an assault on their religion, these publishers did so, they testified, not because the cartoons were news or because editors were hostile to Islam, but because they wished to stand up for their own religion, the religion of free speech. Timothy Garton Ash a member in good standing of the Church of Free Speech, tried in response to the attack on the magazine Charlie Hebdo in 2015 to launch, and I quote him, an appeal for a week of solidarity in which a wide range of newspapers would simultaneously publish a selection of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons with an explanation of why they were doing so, unquote. Presumably the explanation would have nothing to do with the issues raised by the cartoons, but with the obligation, in fact, the religious obligation to publish them as evidence of, doc, of, of, of a doctrinal, doctrinal fidelity to the doctrine of free speech. Ash is asking good free speech liberals to stand up for their faith. Now, I have spoken since the beginning of my remarks of the religion clause as an anomaly. Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that it represents the unacknowledged intrusion into one religious discourse of the imperatives and claims of another. It is as if the first of the amendments of a constitution inspired by liberalism's faith announces a principle, religious speech especially, that belongs to a rival faith. Liberalism faith rests on a belief in the free choice of autonomous individuals not bound by pre-existing authority. Religion's faith rests on a system of belief grounded in a transcendent being whose commands we ought to obey. It is hardly surprising that this ill fit between the Constitution as a whole and one prominent part of it that breathes a different spirit generates a body of cases that cannot be reconciled within any rule or principle. Indeed, it's worse than that. For the religion clause, as you know, is all is itself fissured by its two sub-clauses, one, one elevating religious speech to a position of privilege, the other warning against religious speech as the potential portal of theocracy. To say that these two clauses pull against each other is an understatement. 
Indeed, it is even worse than that because both the free exercise clause and the establishment clause have strong and weak versions. The free exercise clause, as I said earlier, has been read as doing nothing more than glossing the free expression clause, but the free exercise clause has also been read as legitimating religiously inspired acts, even when they are in violation of generally applicable laws. In the same double way, the establishment clause has been read generously as accommodating religious speech in the public sphere, as long as the accommodation doesn't mount to an outright establishment of, of religion. And it has been read, and the establishment clause has also been read severely as forbidding any commerce at all between religion and the civil state in the spirit of Madison's insistence that not three tenths of public funds are to be directed to religious institutions. So in the end, and this is the end, we have a contradiction within an anomaly, an anomaly and within the contradiction, a set of opposing definitions, all combining to fashion a jurisprudence, the jurisprudence of the religion clause, that is unstable, vertiginous, and often just plain nuts. That jurisprudence is in search of a principle. What it finds and participates in is the endless alternation between the competing requirements of liberal egalitarian theory and fidelity to religious doctrine. Neither requirement will ever command the field unless one of two likely, unlikely things occur. That is, unless the religion clause is repealed or the country becomes a theocracy. And where do I stand? Well, on the substantive issues raised by these cases, I could go either way. I'm fine with allowing religious monuments in public spaces. What do I care? I'm fine with insisting that the public sphere be religion free. Sure. I'm fine with letting a few bakers refuse to create cakes for some same sex wedding. I'm fine with enforcing anti discrimination laws strictly and thus forcing the bakers to comply. But I'm not fine with are the acrobatics performed by those who are assigned the task of applying a piece of the Constitution at odds with its informing spirit. That includes those who get around the Establishment Clause by declaring in the face of all the evidence that religious monuments and symbols are not religious. And that also includes those who claim to honor religious free exercise, but then restrict exercise to practices cut off from religion's central claim to be preeminently authoritative. This spectacle is fun to watch and to write about, but it is hardly edifying. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fish. Uh, we do have a good 15 minutes for questions. There are two microphones uh, at the back of the aisles. Uh, so please queue up behind one or the other um, and we'll entertain uh, 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Thank you very much. Destiny? There you go. Um, you said that you could go either way. Yeah. Which way would you have the court go? I don't know. I, I, I think I'd give, uh, I, I, I don't, in my practice, actually uh, declare preferences as to what the court would do. I simply predict, uh, along with everybody else who is a legal academic, uh, I simply predict what the court would do. Uh, so that, for instance, there's now uh, another masterpiece cake shop case making its way uh, through the courts, uh, starring uh, ex exactly the same individuals as Jack Phillips, uh, someone who wanted to make to symbolize something he didn't believe in. Uh, my guess at this moment is that uh, that 
case if it comes to the Supreme Court. I will be decided uh, uh, against the state. That's just a prediction. It's the way I think it will happen. Uh, I don't much care which way it happens. Uh, I'm, you know, if you look at the history of jurisprudence in this area, you're going to find an alternation uh, between uh, landmark cases Johnson v. Yoder, landmark cases in the Supreme Court seem to put great value on the amicus free exercise and all of these rights. Very un unusual decision. We're going to see that. And other land uh, and landmark cases uh, like uh, the Aoki case uh, in Oregon, where the court, uh, in the voice of Justice Scalia, uh, declared that you cannot, in fact, uh, allow a kind a judge, which you can either obey uh, or disobey. So I just, what interests me is the way in which this goes. Uh, and uh, um, as I said, it's finally, I mean, I also talk in other places about course, cases like the case of the, of the cross in the Mojave Desert. Uh, case in the course of Mojave Desert is an interesting one because you would have to go a long way to be offended by it. You know, it's, it's difficult. Now you really have to go out of you. You have you would have to be seeking an establishment cause offense, uh, uh, and uh, and, uh, and so I would have I would have had no trouble allowing that cause to stand. Uh, but what the court did was argue, and some of you will remember, that the cause wasn't really a cause. It was just a patriotic symbol honoring the country's soldiers uh, through uh, decades and centuries. That's just nonsense. So again, I'm interested in the way in which the court tries to negotiate what I take it to be an impossible situation. It's told that it must patrol an area that is a border, really. And that is the, the border that uh, has uh, civil authority and its obligations on one side and religious authority and its obligation on the other side. But the court is told at the same time that it cannot, in fact, say anything about uh, the, uh, uh, the activities of persons on the religious side of the border, because the court cannot presume to meddle uh, in religious affairs. So the court is, at the same time, given a task and disabled from performing it. It's really difficult, and I sympathize with them, uh, with, with the contortions uh, they employ. Uh, the last time I taught the course of uh, my course in uh, uh, religion and the law, I think there were uh, 13 tests by which you could tell whether or not an endorsement clause violation uh, had occurred. 13 tests, 13 different tests. Just on its face, uh, this stuff is, as I've already said, it's, it's entirely zany. Thank you for your presentation. I had a quick question about your, your sort of approach. You mentioned a couple of times that your analysis was conceptual rather than historical. And I'm curious to know what you think in terms of how courts might approach these types of questions. Should they focus on the conceptual frameworks narrowly, or should there be more of a historical engagement with the meaning and evolution of law as it has uh, happened? I would say in response to that question that what they're going to be doing at all times, even when they're not acknowledging it, is making a political calculation. They're making a political calculation. In fact, and this is part of the larger argument in the book uh, that will be published later this year. In fact, all First Amendment decisions are political decisions. Or another way to put this, the First Amendment declared disinclination to take content or viewpoint into account um, is, is in fact never realized and never could be realized. All First Amendment decisions are content-based decisions. Just as there is no general principle 
uh, underlying the religion clause cases. There is no general principle underlying the First Amendment uh, cases. In fact, there is no free speech doctrine, just a collection of ragtag uh, proverbs, uh, proverbs and uh, uh, keywords like the marketplace of ideas, and two statements made at different times by Justice Brandeis. Sunshine is the best of disinfectants, and the remedy for bad speech is more speech, not enforce silence. Those, the, the, the marketplace of ideas in combination with the Brandeis statements are the very pillars of traditional First Amendment doctrine, and those pillars are rotten to the core. Neither the, neither the, the marketplace of ideas uh, nor Brandeis, uh, Brandeis's bromides have any relationship to what, to what goes on in any case uh, brought before the court uh, regarding the First Amendment and freedom of speech. The First Amendment is barely exists. It is at best, and the best is pretty good, it is at best a slogan. Uh, this is something that Frederick Shaw, a scholar at Harvard, Columbia, and the University of Virginia, said long ago in a wonderful essay entitled First Amendment Opportunism. And what he meant by that is that uh, people know, that is litigants know, that if you can wrap your client's cause in the mantle of the First Amendment, you have a better chance than you might have had were you not able to do that? And many, uh, many are able to do that, and they're able to do that because there's nothing inside the First Amendment. And therefore, you can turn it into the clothing that will look good on your client. That's a larger answer <laughs> to the question than the questioner proposed, but it kind of tripped out of me. I couldn't help myself. I hear you drawing a tension between the... A tension, not a tension, which is tension. a tension. A tension. Yeah. Um, between individual conscience as it's understood by liberalism and the requirement within many religious traditions of acquiescence to higher authority. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, your kind of concluding remarks in the lecture are there's no resolving that tension. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are on, and Yoder is a kind of a half example here, um, your thoughts on self-determination for religious communities within a liberal state. Is there any space for a religious community to have self-determination to control its members right. within a liberal state? Well, you're, you're correct in, in pointing to uh, Wisconsin v. Yoder as at least a possible example, and, and also um, the upstate, uh, upstate New York case, uh, Carius Joe, uh, and others would be examples. Well, let's take a look at Wisconsin v. Yoda, which, as you all remember, a case in which the court affirmed the right of Amish parents to withdraw their children from uh, public high school education I think after the eighth grade, in order to A, uh, uh, allow the children to help them on, uh, with the work on the farms, and uh, B, to make sure that they remained accultured or acculturated within the Amish community. Now, why did the court make decide in that way? The answer I would give is the court decided in that way because they saw a wonderful example to affirm liberal principles without any cost whatsoever. Because one of the hallmarks of the Amish community was its, sep its, its tendency to separation from the larger public sphere. It did not wish to colonize, in any way dominate 
certainly not take over the public sphere. So what the Amish, Amish were presenting themselves as, and it was an irresistible, I think, temptation to the court, they were presenting themselves as this cute, insular minority with funny clothes, still many of them driving buggies and speaking a quaint language. And they don't ask anything of us. Uh, and therefore, we can display our liberal tolerance by granting that tolerance to them and never fearing that it will cost us, to repeat Madison's phrase, even three pence. I think it was a wonderfully politically astute decision. Uh, so, in, yes, minorities can at times be granted that ability to order their own affairs in ways uh, that uh, would be denied uh, to, other, to other communities or villages or towns. Now, in the Curious Joe case, it didn't work, much to Antonin Scalia's distress. It just didn't work. And you can, I suppose, if you're clever enough, law professors, and all law professors, of course, are clever enough, uh, you could uh, figure out a way of reconciling decisions like that and subsuming them into some general principle. But if you do that, uh, you're just engaging uh, in some uh, Rube Goldberg exercise. Uh, you, uh, you, 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 you're, you're just, uh, shall we say, indulging your ingenuity, which is another thing that law professors uh, regularly do. I see some law professors in the room uh, nodding uh, to that extent. Uh, yeah. But the large assertion of this paper, which I, and I, I, I assume it came through, is that the religion clause is the title of this paper. Uh, doesn't really belong in the Constitution, although there are good and compelling historical reasons for its being there, but that because it doesn't belong in the Constitution, but is in the Constitution. It will produce all kinds of conundrums that will never be solved. Uh, and you can be sure, if you can be sure of anything, that more of this stuff will be emerging uh, every day. And in my reading, at least, it's a spectacle or even a farce and sometimes very enjoyable and downright hilarious. Anything else? You want to know about the Mueller report? You want? <laughs> I'll answer any question on anything. I have a question, uh, question Professor. Um, why, maybe, it seems to me like your assertion that uh, the religion clause doesn't belong in the Constitution is based on what you were saying about how, um, sorry, that, sorry, take, um, your, take your time. If you have, that, that somehow it would, it would be an inequitable distribu distribution of liberty if you allowed uh, a heckler's veto for someone who's religious but not somebody who just has a secular conscience problem with a law. But if that's your entire justification, I disagree because... If it's my entire justification for what? I, I don't mean... Uh, for thinking that the clause doesn't belong in the Constitution or that there's some internal inconsistency with that. I, didn't, I don't know if it's my entire... Well, go on with your question. I'm okay. Because um, it seems to me that at least you could say everybody gets this right to religion. So even if a person is not particularly religious themselves, they still have this right to religious speech that is being protected, they just are choosing not to invoke it. So to me, it seems like you can have a special place for religion in the Constitution without violating liberal principles. As long as the freedom is not strongly invoked. Uh, that's the point. It's a point made over and over again by uh, uh, noted First Amendment scholars such as uh, Robert Post, uh, recently uh, stepped, uh, who has recently stepped down, last year stepped down, as the dean of uh, the Yale Law School. Uh, and Post and others 
uh, say over and over again, religious free exercise is something we should honor up to the point where it requires some special dispensation from the state as regards uh, the violation of laws that are generally applicable. And what I would say is that that's the only point at which religious free exercise means anything. That's the only point in which the, re the free exercise clause of the religion clause has any significant bite or force. Uh, so uh, I would take your question perhaps ungenerously as one more attempt by liberal pluralism uh, to uh, wash the entire problem uh, or to, in effect, uh, uh, sink the entire problem um, in an ocean of reciprocal generosity, uh, of tolerance. As much as I dislike pluralism, I dislike the idea of tolerance even more. Does that shut everybody up? Want to go eat? Okay.